Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses one to seven. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses one to seven. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their parts. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as we had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But if you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. This is the word of the Lord. Let's come to the Lord in prayer this morning. So, Lord, even as we come to your word, we pray that you grant us your understanding. We pray, Lord, that our hearts will be tender and we will be receptive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, it's good to be back. Uh, last week I was on uh, DS duty at uh, Puchong, like at this church. In fact, today after service, I had to go over to uh, Living Hope Baptist Church for that communion because they're having their 10th anniversary celebration. I'll miss the service because the service starts at 10, but I'll be attending the lunch, which is in church, uh, straight after the service. Now, just one or two things before I go into the message. Um, firstly, um, last Sunday, uh, our brother Elder Tan preached uh, the word, and uh, I listened to the message also on the recording, and I also had a word with uh, Brother Herbert, and first of all, I want to say it is a good sermon, okay, I think that's very important for me to say this, and secondly, I also advise him that to bring a knife or sharp object to the pulpit is not quite appropriate, and he took it uh, very well, okay. And thirdly, he also told me that he got permission uh, from the man that you're sharing about. So he knows that um, uh, the fellow that was sharing about his testimony. Secondly, I covered the press. Tomorrow is my big day. After 15 plus years, my family and I are moving from Klang to SS23 nearby. I reiterate, I covered your prayers also, uh, not just your congratulations. Um, it, it has been a long journey for us. Uh, 15 years ago or more, when we first moved from Ipoh to Klang, my mother was hale and hearty. Uh, tomorrow, I will, I, we actually have to uh, organize for an ambulance to bring her from our home. She has Alzheimer's. Uh, now she can't really walk, so she also has to rely on the wheelchair. So do pray for us. Uh, it's been one thing after another, okay? I remember my wife and I went to Lang County last year, January, that's about 13 months ago, for two nights. And when we came back, uh, we got the news that James auntie passed away in Ipoh. So we got to rush to Ipoh uh, for the funeral arrangement. So Jane and I, we desperately need a holiday, but don't worry, we will organize one when we are more settled. Today, the message is entitled, The Grace of Giving, based on the scripture reading that was uh, read to us just now. 
under the introduction. That we organize membership and baptism class, I believe, uh, under the pastors of this, this church in uh, yesterday years. Uh, there's one chapter, uh, uh, one class entitled The Meaning of Membership. And uh, according to our Book of Discipline, uh, one of the duties of being a church member under paragraph 117 of the Book of Discipline <coughs> is that church members must study the principles of Christian stewardship. And then there are, number, there are a number of words mentioned there, but I'll just highlight some phrases. And they must give of, okay, it's all male gender, but male means refer to men and women as well. Huh? Must give of his substance, and then right at the end, to God and the advancement of God's kingdom. And then also it's mentioned in recognition of God's ownership. He should practice systematic and proportionate giving. So again, um, as people are prepared to be baptized and receive into membership, uh, they are taught about uh, giving. However, in the Book of Discipline, the word tithing is not mentioned there. The phrase rather is systematic and proportionate giving. And I'll comment a little bit more about tithing in a moment's time. Today is also Pet Sunday where the church makes known the plans for 2024 in terms of the money that is needed and the LCC Local Church Executive Committee has decided upon the budget and so it is being presented to the whole congregation so that um, our goal is that people will prayerfully uh, consider how much they want to give uh, to the Lord this year as a pledge. <clears throat> as I mentioned, my dad passed away more than 20 years ago and um, when I was a young pastor, you know, I used to have conversations with him, although I was staying in Perak at that time when uh, he was in KL. And once he told me this, which actually caught me off guard a bit, he said, you know what, I don't pledge to church well. That is not my kin. So my ears picked up. So this is what I do. I don't fill up the text form. Rather, what I decided to pledge I will put in an envelope and drop it as a loose offering in the offering bag. Then he went on to say that um, because he follows the Matthew chapter 6 principle, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, meaning that I do not even want the Fed secretary or the treasurer or the person in charge of pledges to know. Now, I want to uh, say that I don't do like that. Every church that I pastor in, I will fill in the pledge form, and they will know, uh, the, relevant, the relevant person will know how much I pledge, and I'll make a commitment to God, because this is for the budgeting and planning of the church. But what is most important is we need to be prayerful uh, about this. <clears throat> This question I'm going to ask the congregation, all of you. Is asking for money a sensitive topic? Who agrees put up your hands? Oh, so few. I thought more people put up. Who disagrees put up your hand? Okay, some disagree. Who didn't want to put up your hand put up your hands? <laughs> I remember the first church I was pastoring, uh, obviously a very young pastor. Um, I preached at one third Sunday. Then after service, one member of the executive committee of the local church came to me and said, Pastor, you don't want to give you some advice. Of course, young pastor have to try to get as much as advice as possible. Not just young, uh, even now also. Okay. He said, Pastor, next time when you uh, organize your third Sunday, 
please invite the guest preacher. And some people give me feedback like this. Lah. You know, it's very easy for people to say, some people give me feedback like this. Lah. But I also will ask them, do you agree with the feedback that people are giving you? So my ears were picked up already. I said, why? He said, super sensitive topic, money. Then number two, he said, because the church pays your salary. So I said, okay. Now, one or two years after that, I invited guest preachers. But then after, no, I used to come and preach. And I'll explain why in a moment's time. We need to educate our children when they are young. And I always believe the best age is primary school age and also MYM. That's why all those who are teachers in MYM, in Sunday school, you have such an important task uh, to do. I remember when I was in MYM, in those days, if 10 people attend MYM, it's a very big crowd, okay? Because the church was relatively small, uh, so we are very happy. If we look around the 10 people, we are very, very happy. So what happened is that one preacher came, I don't know his name, but he said, you know how do you give the Lord systematically and proportionately? He said, how much is your pocket money? Take one-tenth of your pocket money, and put it aside, put it in an envelope, and write the word pledge, and drop it in the offering bag. In those days, my pocket money is 50 ringgit one month. So dutifully, I said, okay. I took out 5 ringgit, and put it in a white envelope, and just put the word pledge. I didn't even put my name there, and dropped it in the offering bag. So I say this because from that time onwards, I did it. So that when I got my first paycheck as a pastor, there was no problem in terms of pledging to the Lord. In those days, I had just graduated from a secular university, Monash, as well as my theological degree. And I applied to track as a pastor. And this is the year 1992, January. My salary, basic salary, was a handsome sum of 580 ringgit. So I just want to say the following year, Track actually did a revision of salary, so from 580 it jumped to 800 ringgit the following year. But there's no issue at all. No issue because when I was young, I learned about giving unto the Lord. So I want to pose this question, how do you view your money? Do you say this is my money, my hard-earned money, and I am the sole person to decide how I'm going to give my money away? Or perhaps you tell me, uh, Pastor, in my family, my parents and grandparents taught me that frugality is a core value in the family. So my question is, frugal to yourself or frugal to other people? There's a big difference. Because I know people who are very frugal to themselves, they live a very simple lifestyle, they do not spend a lot of money, but when it comes to giving money to other people, they are very, very generous. I remember us in primary school, those days in Penang, uh, we used to have class photo, okay? So the teacher said, class photo, before the days a mobile phone was invented, you had a phone, okay? How many of you remember the old photo, really phone photo in your photo album? Teacher said, you want a copy of black and white photo? 25 cent. So I came back home, I told my parents, I would like the class photo and give me 25 cent a lot. Can, can. So the next week they gave me 25 cents. So I went to class, wanted to buy the photo. Then the teacher said, photo not ready. Next week only ready. Wow, that day I thought, my goodness, I got 25 extra cents today. <laughs> so I went to the tuck shop and bought all sorts of goodies and used up the 25 cents. Came back home. Never expected this to happen. Parents said, 
Where is the photo? So I cannot lie. La. I see teachers say the photo not pretty, only pretty they see. You know what is the second question? Where is the 25 cent? So I have to confess la, that you sit up in a tuck shop <clears throat> and then got a lecture for you sitting up and they say that money is meant to buy photo, not meant to buy extra food in the tuck shop. So the following week, they were gracious, they gave me another 25 cents and I bought the photo, the photo back. Now the analogy is to God. God has given us everything that we have. And God has entrusted us to be stewards. Are we good stewards of the Lord? Do we recognize that, that whatever we do with our money is not my decision, but it is what God's word tells me about how I spend my money. The role of the pastor. Number one in preaching. Number one, ensuring there's no vested interest. So, okay, I come back to my story about the church member who said cannot preach on that Sunday. So then I realized, hey, no need to follow all the advice people give you. You also got a brain you think carefully. Number one, the pastor receives a fixed salary. Okay, in our Trinity Annual Conference Methodist Church system, we all receive fixed salary. Okay? Number two, the salary scale is such that when you're senior like myself and you keep the maximum, that's it. Every year, no more increment. Huh? Ceiling, 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 ceiling. Okay? That's number two. I remember once a friend of mine, uh, this story is a whole story, they lived more than 35 years old. He said in his company, uh, one of the salesmen, wow, he received bonus at the end of the year. Mercedes Benz, uh, the company gave him. Wow, my ears freaked up. So I said, how about like this? He said, because he was given a sales target, he hit the target and exceeded it five times. So the company rewarded him with Mercedes Benz. So why am I telling this story? Because for pastor, there are no such thing. Okay? No incentive, no kickback, no uh, special gift uh, if the number of attendance in church double. Okay? All the same. And uh, it is our annual conference that determines all the SOPs regarding to the uh, pastor's benefits. I'm board of ministry chairman. I know the DOM handbook, what is allowed and what is not allowed, and what is not allowed, special permission must be sought. And usually, board of finance and board of ministry will say no. Because pastors in big church, pastors will all say yes, poor pastor in a small church can't even afford to do this. So that is the reason why I can preach on this Sunday. Number two, safeguarding the integrity at all times. And I'm so glad in our Methodist system, although our of discipline is very bad and thick, there are a lot of regulations there. And one of the things is that pastors must entrust the lay people who are good and honest to handle money matters in the church. Number one, the stewardship and finance chairman. Number two, treasurer. And number three, pledge secretary. Or treasurer may also be the pledge secretary. So the pastor will give spiritual direction and counsel on money matters, but the pastor does not handle any money. I think that's very important because in some smaller churches, independent churches, I've heard the pastor is a signatory to the check account, and that can be also very dangerous. In today's passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, towards the end, verses 16 to 24, uh, Paul actually explains to the church at Corinth that he has appointed Titus, who he trusts so much, to handle the money matters, to take the offering from the Gentile church and deliver it to the church in Jerusalem, or the medieval people there. And number two, an unnamed person who is trusted by the churches. These two people 
will handle the money matters in the collection that is taken from the Gentile churches to the church in Jerusalem. And that is there in scripture. And I thought how wonderful for God to share this with us. Number three, to preach the whole counsel of God. And again, pastors are reminded that they need to preach not only on their pet topic, not only on easy topics, but also on difficult topics. So, for example, I preach on topics like God wants two Christians to be joined together in holy matrimony. And I know I receive plaque after the sermon. I've also preached on LGBTQ, and I know one or two people were not too happy. But the pastor's task is to preach. Focus for today. Excel in the grace of giving. As the church excels in other areas, so may it also excel in the grace of giving. Paul's command to the church at Corinth in verse 7 is excel in the grace of giving. In another uh, book of Paul, or epistle of Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, Paul lists out a list of spiritual gifts, and one of them mentioned there is giving as a spiritual gift. Another gift mentioned there is encouragement. I wonder how many of us are encouragers in this church, because it's mentioned as a spiritual gift. The word grace is a beautiful word in the New Testament. In Greek, it is charis, and also we get the word charismata, or the spiritual gifts. And once a person said, grace is an acronym for God's riches at Christ's expense. First main point of today, the grace of giving in church is of a higher order than other forms of giving. Now how many of you would agree with me if I say that non-Christians can be generous givers? Put up your hands. I'm glad that many of you put up your hands. Because for them, giving may be an act of charity, an act of blessing. I remember many years ago, this is like 20 years ago, I was talking to a, a church leader who was in charge of a renal dialysis center. There was an NGO set up under the church to specially bless uh, the community, those who can't afford it for renal dialysis treatment. Of course, they have to charge patients, but at a much lower cost. And even as I was talking to him, he said the reason why the church set up an, an NGO or instrumental towards this is so that we can appeal to non-Christians to give towards this cause. And then he went on to tell me, you, you know, when, you, when, when I go and appeal to a non-Christian businessman, I don't ask for 1,000, I don't ask for 2,000, I ask for one machine. And one machine those days is 44,000 ringgit. And they will give, as long as you put a small little plug there and say donated by so and so. And so there are non-Christians who are very generous givers. But there are others who also give because of the feel-good factor. Or some want the praises of other people. They are showy displays. And this is seen in scripture. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 to 7, we find that Jesus sits down like a typical teacher rabbi and starts teaching his disciples. And we all know the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of God. And then he goes on. And then right down, 20 verses down, suddenly Jesus says, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a salvo that Jesus was firing towards the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Because the general population regarded them as very holy and righteous. In chapter 6, Jesus goes on to talk about hypocrites. 
But I believe that he was referring back to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He said, when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast, make sure that it is not a showy display. And this is revolutionary teaching. Now Jesus said that they have already achieved their goal. And what was their goal? Their goal was to get the adulation of people. Cheapskate goal. They already achieved their cheapskate goal. But Jesus goes on to tell his disciples and the people who are listening, you have to set a higher goal for yourself. And that goal is to please God and to get your heavenly rewards. Once upon a time, there's a man who was entering, going to enter the pearly gates, and all these pearly gate jokes are fictitious jokes, okay? And so he's carrying two very heavy bags with him. So St. Peter asked him, what is all this about? And then he said, you know, this is my accumulation of gold on earth. Don't know how on earth he's able to get it up there. La, la. So St. Peter said, just put it outside the pearly gates, and then you can enter. No, 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 but I want to take these two bags of gold, gold bars uh, inside. Peter said, that is totally unnecessary. Because in heaven, this is pavement material. Yes, we need to invest in heavenly rewards. The grace of giving begins and ends with Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. The concept of grace is very hard to understand. It is totally against merit, because we deserve to die. But God has pardoned us through Jesus Christ. You deserve all the curses of God in the Old Testament, but instead God has forgiven us. And the very last verse of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4 verse 6, is a warning by God to the people that if you do not repent and turn, you are going to receive curses. And how wonderful when we turn over to the New Testament, the very first thing that we read in the Gospels is about Jesus coming into this world. We, reserve, we, de we deserve eternal damnation, but instead God has given us eternal life. The thief on the cross who turned to Jesus did not deserve eternal life for all that he has done in the past, but at that moment Jesus forgave him and he could enter into paradise. Yes, it is through Jesus that we have become rich because he became poor. If Christ emptied himself for us far more than financial, financially, to save us and to elevate us to be children of God, and there's no further reason needed for us to give abundantly unto God's kingdom ministry. You know, Philippians chapter 2 is such a beautiful hymn of praise there about how Christ emptied himself and God glorified him. Christ gave us everything. It was totally other-centered. His humility and humiliation on the cross just to elevate us to become children of God. And that's a done deal. Now it's a win-win situation. Christ exalted in the heavenlies and we receive the gift of grace and salvation. You know what John, as he wrote the Gospel of John, we can see his relationship with Christ when he was on earth as a human being 
And then when John writes in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, he's trying to describe the glorified Jesus in heaven and words are inadequate. You read Revelation 1, whether in the original Greek or in English, it is an inadequate description of who Jesus is now in the heavenly realms. And that is what Jesus did for us on the cross. Total obedience. There's a beautiful song, and you would know by now that I like to quote songs in my message. How many of you know this song, Put Up Your Hands? If you know, please sing along with me now, or today I'm brave enough to sing. <laughs> There's no greater love than this. There's no greater love than this. That a man would give his life for a friend. There's no higher sacrifice than a man would give his life. You have paid the precious price for the verse goes on to say, you chose me when I was so unworthy. You cleansed me with your own blood. You clothed me with righteousness and mercy. And you crowned me with your steadfast love. Even the foreign magi recognized the gift of God's Son and worshipped the Christ with their treasures. Secondly, we find that the grace of giving continues as we firmly see ourselves as a family of God or members of God's Christ body. You know, for Paul, the concept of church being the body of Christ is so very important. And then he taught the Gentiles well. He said that actually the gospel first came to the Jews. In the Old Testament, the Jews are the people of God, but in God's mercy and grace, he gave us Jesus and open the door for salvation both for the Jews and the non-Jews and you are the non-Jews and you have received salvation now. Now is your opportunity to help members of the same household of God, the Jewish people. And the Macedonians had learned very well what it means to help the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And Paul used their example as a paradigm to the church at Corinth. What was the paradigm that Jesus used in the Gospels? He pointed out a widow who had two small copper coins and put it in the treasury. And he said she gave far more than all the other people. And that was Jesus' paradigm of giving. Paul shares with us the outcome of the Macedonians. They pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the saints in verse 4. Today, the only pleading and the fighting to pay is at restaurants. You go there and two people go and fight with the cashier and say, No, I will pay. No, I'll pay. No, I'll pay. Okay? And the cashier is saying, Definitely, I'll get the payment today. <laughs> These people are fighting to pay the bill. Paul shares with us the initial motivation or underlying motivation that they gave themselves firstly unto the Lord and then unto the godly leadership of Paul and company. Firstly, they submitted unto the Lord. You know, submission to leadership is a dirty word today. In Acts chapter 2 and 4, we find that the early Christians submitted to the apostles. My dad and family, we moved to Penang in the late 1960s. And the only church that he knew in those days was Penang Wesley. And so he went and met a pastor whose name is Ron Butler White. And he said, I'm a young family, we had just come to Penang. I've got a job here. Can we come and worship in your church? 
And though in the old, the pastor said, no, don't come to my church. You know why he said like that? He said there is a smaller church that has started in Penang. And the name of the church is Trinity Methodist Church, Penang. Go over there and serve the Lord there. And so my father, very beautifully, what the pastor said, he obeyed. And that is why he had nine plus years of glorious uh, time of getting to know people and worshipping the Lord in that church. Today, as district superintendent, I mentioned the church I'll be visiting later, does not have a pastor. It's called Living Hope Methodist Church. And the average attendance is only about 25 to 30 people. And when I ask and encourage people to go over there, all sorts of reasons are given to me of reluctance. Times have changed. Things have changed. But what's more amazing is that the Macedonians were financially poor. And Paul mentions that they had overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. Robert Gundry, New Testament scholar, says, the original Greek says something, their flourishing joy and abysmal poverty has flourished. How can joy and poverty flourish at the same time, according to this passage? Because they said they have a never die attitude they will give and give and give. And that is the right attitude. In the application of God's teaching in our life, we need that kind of attitude. God, your word says this, and I want to follow up to you. The Bible tells us that God, in the Old Testament days, is called Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. And we remember the incident of uh, Abraham, his son Isaac, and the ram. Mount Moriah. And so we appeal to help others and we give our very, very best towards this. Good leaders disciple disciples well. And again, Paul mentioned about Titus. Titus went there, he started teaching the Corinthians about giving. And Paul encouraged them in verse 6 complete that good work the good teaching that they have already received in the area of giving. Good leaders always will disciple others to see Christ intimately connected with the church. And as I mentioned, Paul gives two very beautiful analogies in his writings. The bridegroom is Christ, the bride is the church, Ephesians chapter 5, and Christ is the head and we are the body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And that is why it's very important for CG leaders and CG ministries. The CG leaders emphasize to the members that we are one unit, we are one body, although we are many parts. And what happens when there's bad blood between us in the CG or among church members? Strained relationships. Go back to the renal dialysis machine. What's the function of the renal dialysis machine? To take out the bad blood and clean it and put the good blood back into your body, right? I mean, that's very crudely putting it. And so we must be like renal dialysis machine. Agents of being able to take out that bad blood with the power of God and help to clean it and make it clean blood for the body of Christ. Let me just end with some practical application for today. All our blessings, financial included, come from God's abundant grace given to us. And we are only stewards, not the owners. And that is why Paul talks about the grace of giving. It is indeed a grace that first originates from God. How many of you play, have played Monopoly in your life before? Put up your hands. Uh, as a child, I loved Monopoly. Okay? Monopoly is the game where you go around, 
you try to get as much as money as possible, you build uh, houses, you build hotels, and when people land on your property, you get money from them. So the object of the game is to be the richest person. And you know what is a side effect? You make everybody else bankrupt like, at the same time. But what happens at the end of Monopoly? All the money is brought back, stacked up nicely into denomination notes. All the pieces are put back nicely into the box. And the box is closed. So none of the money is ours. We had momentarily joy because we were the winners. But that's it. And dear friends, sometimes it's like that. God has given us everything. We are stewards. We must not gloat over other people that we have made it well in life and take it out at them. Rather, we must bless others. That God has given to us. God's love, mercy is abundant. And so even as I end, I just want to say this. Let us recognize the divine grace on us as a church and respond to it by excelling in the grace of giving. Lord, we come before you today, Lord. We recognize that everything is yours. We recognize that Jesus gave us parables about giving and about money and about possession. And Lord, even today, Lord, as we hear the budget being presented, Lord, even as we come and worship you, and then when we go back home, we prayerfully consider how much we want to make that commitment to you this year. We pray, Lord, that you bless every moment of the journey. And Lord, we submit this whole worship service into your hands. In Jesus' name.